Hi, I'm Ken. Let's talk about motors. At some point, you're going to want to make something move, whether it's a robot or a mechanism or an airplane or a car. And the thing that's really baffled me for so many years is that so many people think they know how to use motors, but don't. So let's start talking about motors. These are some that we may think about for using in robots. Traditionally, there's lots of different kinds of motors, but this is probably the most common motor you're going to see for a low cost apparatus. Direct current, permanent magnet, brushed motors. Let's get into that and see what we see. This is what's inside of a motor. There's three basic parts. There's a stator, which is the part that doesn't move. It's normally made of very strong permanent magnets. Then there's this rotor, which is a spinny part. Now the rotor is really a cool thing. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but it's a part that actually creates the torque in most motors. And then finally, there's this very clever device, which is called the commutator, which is where the word brushed motors comes from, because the commutator has a bunch of contacts there, which are called brushes. This is a typical motor you might find on a lot of, of small robots. Uh, actually, this is pretty powerful. It's about a, a third of a horsepower. It's called a sim motor, and, uh, and it's a DC brushed motor. So let's take it apart. Here's end cap, nothing there. Inside here, you'll see, oh, lots of electrical stuff. I pull it out of here. That is the rotor. This is the part that's going to do the actual spinning. On one end of it, you see these contacts, which are called part of the commutator. This is the commutator. And as the, as the uh, rotor spins, uh, you can see that the commutator, which, with different connections to the electromagnet, spins as well. Now, the reason why it's forced to spin is, of course, because of these huge permanent magnets, hence the name brushed permanent magnet motors. These will be a north on one side and a south on the other, and interacting with electromagnets then causes the torque. Now the clever part, of course, and the part that makes it a brush motor, are these two electrical contacts made out of graphite or carbon, and these are what actually engage on the commutator to switch the voltage and the current that goes through these wires. They do some pretty clever stuff, but there's also, of course, the reason why brush DC motors do wear out. These, these brushes will eventually wear out, and they also make a little bit of a mess. Okay, so now we've seen what it looks like uh, in real life. Uh, let me go to one more picture here, and we'll show you what it looks like when it's actually spinning them. So you'll see in this diagram, uh, the, um, the electrical conductors through the brushes will interact with the commutator, and the cool thing about it, they switch the sense of the magnets which are in the electromagnet part of the armature. And so one of the things which is not clearly understood, and I want you all to understand, is that actually a DC motor, which takes DC power from a battery, actually through the, through the mechanism and the wonder of the commutator, changes that into alternating current inside of the motor. And that's pretty cool. In fact, every motor does that in one way or the other. There's alternating current that's happening to make electromagnets uh, continually spin. So having said all that and viewed that, let's just look at some of the most basic foundations of electric motors and what they really do. We know what's inside of them, now what are they supposed to do? Well, ideally a motor, it's a transducer, it changes electrical power into mechanical power. But it's not perfect. And in fact, um, as we know from thermodynamics, power can exist in lots of forms. And so motors can do one of two things at least. They can convert electrical power into mechanical power, or they can also, undesirably, normally, convert electrical power into thermal power. So now let's review what this power stuff really is. Of course, electrical power is simply the input to our system, and that's going to be volts times amps, the potential times the current. And that is a very lovely uh, number to work out. One volt times one amp is going to be one watt. Pretty sweet. Again, looking at the motor we just looked at, that SIM motor, for example, if we were to power it with 12 volts, which it was designed for, and we load it to the point where it has 40 amps input, then you can see it would have 12 times 40, or 480 watts of input power. But that's not what we want. We want output power. And so let's review what mechanical power is, which is what we really want to have. In the most basic terminology, mechanical power is the rate in which work is being done. Now, very seldom do you find a motor that says, oh, this can do so much work. Motors are rated on, on how much torque they can produce and how fast they spin. Now, the cool thing about that is if you multiply those two together, the spinning speed, typically in RPM, and then the torque output, that becomes a measure of mechanical power. Now, you've got to throw in some 
some um, uh, conversions in order to get into watts or horsepower, but nonetheless, it does tell you what mechanical power is. So in that same motor, that same sim motor that was inputting 480 watts, we would find out that when it is absorbing 40 amps at 12 volts, it would be spinning 3800 RPM and creating about 6.15 inch-pounds of torque. Multiply that out, provide some conversions, and you'd find out you have a whopping 275 watts of mechanical power output. Seems pretty good. That's about a third of a horsepower, by the way. Now, the interesting thing, though, if you look at it, we had 480 watts input, but we only have 275 watts output. So what happened to the rest of it? That's heat. And in fact, that's something you should understand about all motors, is that no matter how good the motor is, it always does produce some heat. It is possible to make a motor run so it produces no mechanical power, but it is impossible for a motor not to produce electrical heating. There's a few more things we need to understand about this whole relationship between torque and RPM. First off, torque is what motors do. I mean, there's, there's no point of having a motor that spins and doesn't have any kind of an output. So a torque is actually the twisting effort. Now, when you build something and you want it to lift something up, or you want it to have a force on the edge of a wheel such that you can push or pull something, that requires torque. Now, the most interesting thing about torque is that it's not intrinsic to a motor. A motor doesn't have a limiting amount of torque that you can get out of it. In fact, it's unlimited. If you use a transmission at the end of a motor, you can produce infinite torque from the smallest little motor. On the other hand, mechanical power now is the rate of doing work. And in fact, now if you have a mechanism, say a robot, that has to go so fast or has to lift itself at a certain feet per second lifting, now you're talking about work over time. And that is power. Now notice when we talked about torque, nowhere did we have the, the parameter of time in there. Unlimited torque, but it may take you months to do it, right? But with power, we're talking about speed of a mechanism. So anytime we're, you're dealing with that, how fast something has to move, how fast something has to react, then it requires power. And now, unlike torque, power is set by motor design. You can only get so much power of a motor. In fact, anything you put onto a motor, like a transmission, only decreases power. But this, gives, this leads into the most important parts of a motor, which is how do these things all combine? How does torque, RPM, current, how does this all come together? Next session, we'll talk about that.